Is this better? Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to mute everyone and <clears throat> so thank you very much everyone for joining us i uh, you will be muted throughout the the uh, the talk and the speakers you will you will be able to unmute yourself and talk it's just to make sure that we are not um there's not a double conversation going on. So thanks for joining today. And today's uh, webinar, we are going to talk about challenges affecting postgraduate nursing education and how is it a juggling act. So my name is Pavi Nali and I work at the University of Sheffield as senior lecturer. Wow. And th these webinars, we do it every alternate week on the subjects of research, education and practice. The idea being, I mean, it all started off from um, trying to help colleagues in Pakistan to um, to talk about various issues and to basically uplift and play our role in, in the profession if we can uh, somehow and to provide a platform where we are able to talk about the issues that we are facing, learn from colleagues in other countries and see how we can actually apply those um, learning into the practices in Pakistan. Um, as we evolved, now we get audience from all over um, um, other countries, and I have been um, um, privileged to uh, uh, invite colleagues from various Sigma uh, places, um, Sigma uh, chapters, um, and uh, today is one of those evidence because Janice is from, Je Janice, which chapter you belong to? Uh, you're mute. I'm in Kappa, which is at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Yeah, and then uh, I am in FIMU chapter, um, and I also contribute to the European chapter, and then we have got SAMI, and that is a recently uh, developed chapter, and from Pakistan, Zohra is from raw delta and uh, i am also associated with raw delta chapter as well so uh, basically so we've started building on from there but i think i've kept it out of sigma because the reason was i wanted other people members who are not in the sigma to benefit from it especially in the context of pakistan so it, it has been going well alhamdulillah so today we are going to talk about as i say the challenges that we face with regards to postgraduate education b is postgraduate research education or postgraduate teaching related experiences and what are the students experiences what are the challenges that faculty and the institution face when developing pg programs and delivering pg programs and what are the lessons that we can learn um, from all those talks because it's very rare that you get <laughs> people who are uh, 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 practitioners who are faculty as well as those who are designing and delivering the program and those who are who are undergoing those programs. So it's very rare that you bring all these people into one space um, to learn from their experiences. So I think um, it would be quite useful to talk about that. So each speaker would have about six to eight minutes to talk about their experiences and what they have to say. And once they have um, finished, all the talks have finished, then uh, we could take questions and answers from uh, from the colleagues on the panel um, uh, and, and people, uh, you know, colleagues who are attending the, the program today. Um, so if you have got any questions, you can keep on typing into the chat box. And at the same time, you could um, keep a note of your question. And once we have the, the, the speech, uh, talks are finished, I will let you have the control of, of your um, uh, mi microphone and you can talk and you can ask those questions. So the idea is to make it, it's not a one-sided discussion, but if we can make it interactive, that helps a lot. So, um, so without um, any delay, I would like to call upon my first speaker, <coughs> who is, uh, I'm just going to put everybody on mute again, because I think some people have uh, just joined and they're not muted. Uh, okay, uh, so I've put everyone on mute. So my first speaker is uh, Zohra Kurji. And uh, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, just type it into the chat box so I know that it's fine. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. So our first speaker is Zahra Kurji. Zahra is working at the Aga Khan University 
um, university. She's working as an assistant professor there and also <clears throat> lactation consultant. I will have Zohra to tell you a little bit more um, about herself um, in terms of her education. And Zohra's master's is from UK. So she will be able to draw on her experiences of studying in Pakistan and in the UK and what sort of expectations she had as a student, what sort of challenges she faced as a as a PG, uh, postgraduate student and the idea for having students to start off with that, you know, it will allow myself, Janice and Sami perhaps who are and, and even Zohra and Shahida, you know, now that, you know, we have been students once and now we are delivering PG um, education and it's very easier to not to um, it's very easy to forget what your experiences are. Um, so I think this place would platform would provide us to talk about those experiences and learn that how things have changed and what is it that we need to do. Uh, so Zohra, thank you so much for joining. Over to you. Um, if you could unmute yourself um, and uh, please uh, start. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Parveen, for a, a kind introduction and invitation for this uh, webinar. Uh, so, hello everybody. Hello. It, it's good afternoon here, but some part of the world, it is good morning. So, uh, hello uh, and assalamu So, uh, just my introduction is that uh, uh, right now I'm assistant professor at Al Khan University. So, my basic education uh, diploma in nursing and post RN in nursing is from uh, Al Khan University. And uh, then um, uh, I'm also the lactation consultant. I'm the pioneer lactation consultant in Pakistan. And just recently uh, I have uh, holding the flag as in first nurse uh, initiating first nurse led model uh, in terms of clinical practice. So uh, the journey is a little bit uh, longer, but here I would uh, love to talk about my experiences on postgraduate education. So when I did my BSCN uh, in 2006 and with my rich experience as a uh, community practitioner, uh, I would love to join uh, a, the program where I can uh, build my experience into the knowledge. And as in being mother of three, I was uh, not able to left uh, the country and uh, they really, every mother, you know, needs to be stay with their children. So I was looking for some sort of uh, program which needs to be bland in terms of where I can be with my family and to to uh, complete the education. So uh, and of course I would like to do a specific in terms of uh, primary health care. So uh, while searching all these things I find out that there's a very limited um, programs available which can cater all the needs of uh, what I was looking for it. So uh, then University College of London, I found one program and it was in Bland and uh, uh, it was in international primary health care. So, and luckily I got the admission. Uh, so first, first issue is uh, the program which we, which we address the woman uh, as in being for the higher education is very important because uh, woman has a multiple responsibilities uh, to juggle and then uh, keeping and uh, growing in the profession is very important. And nurses is a purely, uh, lots of women is holding the same issues, which you know I had in a student. So first was the program which can cater the need. And then of course, then the next part is the funding. So availability of funding to such a country where definitely the country which we belongs to, when we convert the rate, we try to admit in the program where our conversion rate in terms of money is very low, but our money devalues very fast here. So then it's the burden on the student to uh, for the devaluation of our own money in terms of the amount of money which we are forcing to pay for the education is the second thing, which uh, is a really hard on the student. And definitely then, uh, because I was lucky enough to have, uh, was working in the university, Al Khan University, where we do have a support in terms of funding, in terms of other avenues where uh, it was the goal of the university that every fac single faculty would be the master faculty in such timeline. So the stakeholder uh, vision was there. So it, you know, keep us going in terms of having all these issues. 
so once i enroll in the program and then i uh, i was just thinking to do my research work in my own country whereby i have a, a cultural context uh, uh, relevance information which can help my country in terms of uh, solving those issues so my research topic was around uh, childbirth education so when i ready to collect the data definitely the clinical practice the clinical site research site is also another issue which students could find limitation that where they will do the field work would the mentor would be available in that field work specific to the topic where you are growing so these all sort of issues are there for the higher education or the post graduate education and when i uh, grow more and more in terms of educator in after my post graduate when i become an educator i realize that these sort of issues the validation of the experience the standardization of the experience could be sought out by having some sort of uh, clinical uh, standard um, uh, experiences so at that time definitely uh, as a student it gives you a lots and lots of frustration where you don't find such field side where you can work the mentors uh, the expertise expertise in terms of clinical areas and then of course uh, when the other participants are there so cultural adaptability of the student is also one of the issue whereby um, if you have a diverse group and if you have a diverse sort of uh, information so it's somehow it is a blessing but other way it is also hard to prove yourself as my master was for the physician it was for the nurses it was for the all sort of health professional in the class so it took time uh, when i try to change their perceptions when they talk about the physician role physician role physician role and at the end of the course everybody realize it is not only the physician role it's a healthcare provider role because nurses are also the part of the healthcare provider team so my master as well as not all the nurses was there but finally you know it give me the courage to change the perceptions as in being nurse that uh the delivery care delivery is not only focus of the physician rather than it's a healthcare delivery model where the nurses are the important part of the uh that team so um i think and then standardization of the assessment is also one of the issues because sometimes as in being student you are not aware with the assessment which the other university is giving you because it's a, your educational system where you are in uh in terms of not in the habit of those system where they assess you and then i think it's a great challenge because i did experience uh, some of the certification i had from university of johns hopkins i have some uh, experience here in pakistan and then i had experience in the uk so three country experiences assessment when i look at it i can easily relate there's a vast difference in terms of assessment and in terms of perceptions of the supervisors so uh, i i will not comment which country is best or which is not but you know the as a student i feel that uh, the tools of assessment assessing the students is also one of the biggest challenge that gives the students a lots and lots of frustration why the expectation doesn't meet with the specific criteria so i think i have made my point here so over to you parveen Thank you so much, Zora, and um, that's really useful. Thank you so much, and I would like to ask um, Shahida, um, our next speaker. So Shahida has had experience, like uh, Zora had uh, uh, studying in uh, uh, Pakistan and then in the UK. Shahida has experience of studying in Pakistan for her undergraduate as well as her master's level education, and. so the idea was that we would learn from both of these aspects and try and see uh, contrast and compare and and build a picture from there so shahida over to you uh, shahida is working um, in uh, um, shahida did her bachelor's from dow university and masters from lums and at the moment she's working with um, uh, in the province of sindh in in one of the uh, government settings um, and is also contributing in many other ways so shahida just tell us a little bit about yourself and then about your experiences thank you so you have to unmute yourself
Chada, you can unmute yourself now. Okay, while Shahida is trying to unmute um, herself, um, uh, are there any, would anyone like to comment or anything while we are waiting? <clears throat> Hello. Yes, thank Hello. you Shahida. Yes, Hello. you've managed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, signal problem. No? Issue is big issue in the more issue is in Pakistan. Yes. Signal. Not a problem. So just tell us a little bit about yourself and then about your experiences of um, uh, in terms of master's program and what your expectations were and what challenges did you face? Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to everyone. I'm thankful to you that you gave me a chance to talk on this burning issue. First of all, uh, I, uh, my introduction is I'm Shaida Khan, as you well about me. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I did my diploma from Civil Hospital Karachi. This is also government institution and uh, post in from Dow University and MSN from JPMC. These all are government uh, organizations and my experience uh, completely in government sector and working and uh, education side both. Uh, so my experience is uh, um, too much hard. And uh, uh, overall, I, I'm uh, talk to about journal uh, issues and challenges. We and uh, we uh, face on the this uh, education side and services sites also. We all know about nursing education in postgraduate uh, post program. This academic level is particularly important to the nursing profession. Uh, studying all the master level leads to an enhanced self-esteem, further personal and professional growth and increase knowledge of nursing theories. But we, I understand the most important element is expectation. Expectation about services sites and education sites both. And it's also uh, our uh, nature because we all are human and human nature is always uh, accepted to others many more. So as a student, we as a especially postgraduate student, we expected more for uh, our uh, mentors, our preceptors and our supervisors, but uh, situation is different. Uh, Zora also uh, share uh, our experiences all over the country. So same in uh, Pakistan, postgraduate student nursing is, uh, students, their supervisors is required in order to meet the expectation, rise journal student satisfaction. Postgraduate students have to manage many things as their jobs, family, and their responsibilities. That's why they have shortage of time because we all are in uh, uh, services side and uh, supervisors also give to uh, uh, not sufficient time for uh, our thesis, our research work and doesn't uh, cooperate it with us. It discourages students, supervisors should understand their inner issues in order to make good relationship with them. And uh, and of this, uh, overall the re result become the relief the postgraduate students accept their supervisors, not only to, to guide and support them in education and research, but also good communication skills be professionally and value of professionalism. But uh, everything is opposite sometime. Uh, as a student, we uh, give not uh, sufficient time. And as a supervisor, uh, lacking from uh, time limitation and other problems, families issues, um, <clears throat> transport is issues, time management issues. So we 
uh, face some many more challenges as postgraduate students. Hello, give to. Um, yes, Shaida. Um, have you finished? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much. And I think both of you have talked about really very, very important issues in terms of the, the practical stuff, which is, um, which affects students and their progression, which is talking about expectations, talking about, uh, um, you know, the, uh, what do you expect from their supervisors, how the academic supervision and how they, they are able to support. Um, and I think in my experience of working in Pakistan and in the UK and internationally with other institutions at different places, what I find is that perspective of, of faculty and teachers is also something which is not always um, listen to so while students find it very uh, find it very hard to th their experiences and especially masters usually we do it in a time especially when it comes to the context of nursing so most of us are you later most of us do that later in life um, or, or not a lot later in life but perhaps you know when you already in practical life you're already working you've got lots of responsibilities at home or you're juggling work as well as the education we we don't always have the luxury to to just only go for education so I think that makes it difficult but one of the other thing which I um, have found is the ability to write and I think when it comes to Pakistan one of my biggest concern usually is that um, I think it's relevant everywhere but in Pakistan it just becomes a little bit more pronounced so ability to write and ability to write effectively and articulate your your point of view is something which everyone struggles but when you um, add the dimension of language especially in the context of Pakistan where we um, we, we, the, we, we use Urdu and English languages and when it comes to medicine, nursing and things like that, our written language is English. Uh, we don't necessarily speak English frequently or, you know, in our normal life, but anything that we write, especially for the assignments or for any dissertation or for any other aspects, that is in English. So that struggle has always been uh, there. And plus the, the, the lack of ability to read and critically analyze issues uh, uh, that you're reading and having the confidence to say what you want to say and having the ability to critique documents is something which um, I find quite um, a lot troubling. And as I say, it's not that it only happens in Pakistan. But I think in, in the context of Pakistan, it becomes much more relevant because of when we add the, um, the issues around education as well. Um, so, so thank you so much. So you all have identified very important points. I just wanted to mention these so that, you know, once, once Janice is talking about uh, um, the, her experiences and what does she see as someone who designs the program, who delivers the program and who regularly deals with masters and PhD students, what, where is she coming from? And also in another part of the world, like, you know, what you're talking about what's happening in Pakistan, let's hear what's happening in, in developed countries. So I've just given a little bit of glimpse of what I think. And now I would like to invite Janice Agazio uh, to talk about that. Dr. Janice is currently Assistant Dean and Ordinary Professor and the Director of the PhD and DNP program at the Catholic University of America uh, in the School of Nursing and is, is, she's an Associate Professor. Um, so Janice, thank you so much for joining us and it would be lovely to hear from you what do you make out of the discussions and the experiences that students have, um, uh, our, I mean uh, our speaker students have shared and do they resonate to you? What do you think about them? Thank you. Absolutely. We know you were just talking about the writing. We, that is a constant challenge for us is to uh, have our students write at the level and at the crit critical thinking level of critiquing the research and be able to extract it. So I wanted to start a little bit. Uh, my background is that uh, I was an army nurse and uh, retired at, at 22 years from the army and started then my late uh, entry into the academic setting. So now I've been teaching for 
This is my 16th year at Catholic University. And before that, I was four years at Uniform Services University. One of the things with the US is that, um, just to kind of mention about our postgraduate education, is we have kind of a, a alphabet soup of different degrees. So at this point, um, individuals that have gotten their baccalaureate degree will often come back for the master's of science degree. And they can do some specialization in education and administration. Uh, they could also become a nurse practitioner uh, in women's health, pediatrics, adult health, family health, psychi psychiatric nurse practitioner. They can go back for anesthesia and become a certified registered nurse anesthetist. They could become a midwife. They could become a clinical specialist. And so we have this alphabet soup for the uh, masters, but we're making a shift in the US to having that degree become obsolete. And so that when students come back for their postgraduate education, they're going for the new degree called the Doctor of Nursing Practice. And what that is supposed to do is to give them a terminal degree. They're called doctors, just like the PhDs will be, but their focus is on translating evidence into practice. So the skill sets that they get are becoming um, a consumer of research to be able to critically look at and then bring that to the clinical setting and apply it and then assess you know, the outcomes to see did they improve patient care. They also get skills in leadership and finance so that they're sitting at the table with um, uh, the other administrators to be able to talk the numbers and the dollars and the cents, because a lot of times nurses get left out of those discussions when the door closes in the boardroom. So that was part of the, the focus for that as well. We have standards of nursing practice that we have to meet because to get those licensures as nurse practitioners or the other degrees, uh, the program has to be accredited. And most, we have two accrediting bodies, um, the CCNE and the NLN, AC kind of uh, are our accrediting agencies. Most often are the, the CCNE uh, does the programs that are the graduate level programs. So that um, there's also standards to get their certification that they have to meet as well in the program. And we're in kind of a shift right now to different standards. We have what's called the essentials of nursing practice and they're shifting that now to have different essentials that we have to meet at different levels. So there's gonna be an entry level to practice essentials and then there are competencies as they're going to competencies and then there's a graduate level of competency. So we're all kind of working right now in terms of the uh, programs to kind of get that shift so that we can make sure that we're meeting those standards so that we can continue to be an accredited program. Because without accreditation, uh, our graduates can't get licensure, basically, so that we need to be able to, to meet those standards. Uh, some of the things that we've had as challenges are very, very similar to what you all were talking about as well. Uh, in terms of graduate education, people are busy. You know, so that they, um, there's this, this um, discussion, I go to some of the educational conferences and there's discussion about when should students come back. They've gotten their baccalaureate degree. There's one set of individuals that say they should just come back and get those degrees done so that we have this longevity of them being able to come back and practice at that level. Others, you know, the other side of it is they need to get out and practice with their um, baccalaureate or their you know, first degree to get that critical thinking, to be able to really kind of let all that um, knowledge that they uh, learned kind of gel and, and be able to do the uh, level of nursing care. Because once they go to nurse practitioner or one of the other roles, they may be diagnosing and actually being in charge of the treatment. So they need to understand and have that grounding. So we're, we're kind of in that little bit right now. Uh, we're also having a push to include more interdisciplinary. I heard some other of you talk about that, uh, that we have been in our own little uh, kind of box for so long, and we need to teach our students how to interact and how to understand what other roles are that are um, being played out in the healthcare system so that they understand what their specialties are and how we can tap into that and work together to provide care for our patients. Um, of course, with the COVID, we have gotten uh, a lot of things going on right now with, uh, and fortunately our programs, we'd already figured out how to be online. 
we have our nurse practitioner programs online, we have our PhD online, we have our DMP online. So when we shifted over uh, to the online with the COVID, uh, we were in pretty good shape at my school, other schools not so much, but um, we've uh, been adapting to that. But the challenge has been getting those clinical hours because those are required as well. For our undergrads, that's been really, really tough. For our graduate students, you know, we've been able to uh, work with them to find, uh, maybe they have to do telehealth or they have to do some other kind of activities within a practice, but we've been trying to help them, you know, tap into uh, those clinical hours so they can continue with their education. We're constantly, you know, um, working with them with that balance that you all were talking about. Uh, that's been helped with the online piece because all of our students are working nurses. And so we have uh, split off kind of our curriculum. So they're taking one to two courses a semester and then the, the program progresses so they can finish up a nurse practitioner. They can finish up a DNP in two years. Sometimes the nurse practitioner takes longer because they've got to get the clinical hours in, but that's been very helpful. And I would say one of our uh, challenges right now is that especially with the um, COVID, I think it's putting a lot of pressure on our faculty. And we already had what was called graying of faculty, that there's a lot of uh, older faculty, myself included, that are getting close to retirement years. And what is this uh, COVID uh, going to do in terms of that pressure? Some nurses, some of their faculty were not ready to go. They didn't understand online education. So that's been an extra pressure on them. We're working harder. And we may see a lot of uh, nursing faculty hang up their uh, to go retire after this is over or in the near future. And we were already on the cusp of kind of having that, uh, we had to have faculty shortages, we have waiting lists to get into nursing programs. And so if we do have a mass exodus of older faculty, we may be in a lot of uh, pain for trying to get the pipeline continued to get um, uh, advanced practice nurses or postgraduate nurses out there. And so I'm looking at my list here, and I think I was making notes of what to speak about. But, you know, I think the big challenge right now is trying to convince nursing faculty to what we call shoot the sacred cows of nursing education, because we've always felt like, oh, this is the way we have to do it. These are the courses, and this is the way we teach it. And with this now, with the COVID, it's pushing us to think of other models of education, other ways we can get that out to the students uh, and be just as effective and produce just as safe a practitioner. So I'll stop there for you. Thank you, Janice. Uh, that was really wonderful. And I think, you know, the same sort of issues in terms of trying to understand um, the, the, the balance between placements and the balance between theory and how do you actually arrange placements and how does that work in terms of students' ability to engage with the patients, insurance-related stuff, how get all that uh, is covered and what would, could be the proportion of um, uh, the clinical placement as well as the theoretical hours has always been um, a bone of contention everywhere. And I think uh, we've been having this discussion in Pakistan in one of the groups where uh, people want to try and develop advanced uh, nurse practitioner programs, but debate always goes on to should these be degree programs or should these be master's program. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that that discussion has uh, ha happened and still is happening in, in developed countries like UK and U US. What have been your experiences with regards to that? With Give me the, 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 the uh, you know, the, the, the debate between should nurses be able to prescribe or work as nurse practitioner oh. at the point of degree uh, with undergraduate degree, or should they have a master's prepared um, a qualification to be able to do that? And what should be the constituents of master's program? That has been a debate in, at your end as well, isn't it? Uh, well, for us, it's definitely they have to have the advanced degree because there are other standards that come out from our practitioner associations that they have to meet and to, to be able to get prescriptive privileges. I'm a nurse practitioner myself, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. And to get prescriptive privileges, you have to be certified and then get an advanced license within your state. Different states have different levels of approval. Some states are completely shut down. We're still working to try and get uh, prescriptive privileges in those states. Others, um, Maryland was like that for a while that we had to have a physician 
immediately accessible. We had to have a plan for what we could prescribe, what we couldn't prescribe. And then there's other states, now Maryland has opened up, that we can have completely autonomous practice based upon the fact that we have a cert, um, the degree, the certification, and the licensure. So there's a lot of different steps uh, before you can do that. And the, and the programs themselves will include, you know, advanced pharmacology, advanced uh, pathophysiology, you know, a lot of those, uh, and then the clinical hours as well with a preceptor to supervise, you know, your diagnostic skills as well as, um, you know, coming through with the prescription and, and the treatment part of the, of the encounter. Now you're, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's just being on mute. Um, so thank you so much. I would like to open up the floor for um, for a, a discussion and uh, uh, and let people ask uh, questions, if that's okay. So I'm just going to uh, give everybody the right to unmute themselves. Please, once you've asked a question, keep yourself on mute. Uh, if you are not speaking, that would be great. I'll just... Uh, do this. So I am going to mute you all, but then now you can unmute yourself. Um, so please raise your hand um, if there's any question and then we could uh, start asking them. Um, so while people are doing that, first question from Shaheen, she's talking, what are the university requirements for PhD in nursing? And do the programs um, is, is blended? Um, Shaheen, I'm not sure who do you wanted to ask this question. I think there are different PhD programs in different parts of the world. And as Janice have said, um, more recently, there are blended programs as well. There are split PhD programs in which what you do is do your course requirement or some of the other aspects in the universities where you are uh, enrolled, but then do uh, for rest of the stuff, stay in the countries where you are. Split programs can also take the form of where people collect data from the countries or from the places where they're living in and just go and have uh, you know, some connections with uh, with the university over time over their PhDs. Uh, with COVID, all face-to-face -face programs that we, we have been delivering for even for PhD students. So I have got five PhD students at the moment and all interaction with them is taking place online. Um, in terms of uh, the, the meetings that we used to have every month, they have taken the shape of online meetings now. Um, and it's still quite constant contact uh, all the, 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 the lectures or all the courses that people were doing have already transferred online just to make sure that people have got the ability to connect to their uh, faculty and, um, and things are moving up. So, and I think with COVID things have changed quite a lot. And so there would be quite a lot of opportunities going forward. I think it was more of people's attitudes towards online learning than the online learning itself. Uh, if that wasn't a problem, it was us who were not ready to do it. Um, I'll take a question from Atta, but you know, would you like to comment on that, Janice or uh, Zohra or anybody else? Yeah, I was going to say for, for us, just like you said, we have a lot of international students that come. That's how I met Sammy, uh, who is going to join us today. Uh, and that so far, most of the international students have to go in person for the coursework. So they come to our school for the two years that we have our uh, coursework, which is uh, theory, statistics, research methods, uh, but then they usually we will help them uh, develop their proposal while they're with us. And then when they come ready to do their research, they go back to their own countries to do the research. And we work with, um, usually they'll have a mentor that or a committee member that will be in their own country and then we'll work with them uh, together to, uh, they'll get the, their IRBs and everything in their country and then um, uh, once they have the research done, they come back and we help them get the final product uh, produced uh, with the writing and then defend it and then graduate. So um, I'm not sure what the, the blended, um, because we have two programs. We have the campus program and we have the online program, but so far because of international rules, I guess they can't do the online program. So this year, none of our international students came in for their, they would do the accepted, I think five and we couldn't get any of them out of their countries into ours. So that was tough. So, um, but one of the things that's interesting that I'm seeing as a trend is people that want to get both sets of skills, the DMP skills and the PhD skills, because DMP is translational, PhD is generation of knowledge. So I call them the double Ds, 
they'll come back, they'll do one doctorate in the PhD side, then they'll come back to do the DMP side, which is crazy. But there are schools in the states that are blending those programs so that they're getting both degrees as they go through the program. But we haven't gotten there yet, so. Thank you. Thank you. Athar Saeed, you wanted to ask a question, so please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm a physician, I work in the UK. I uh, trained uh, for my medical degree in Pakistan many years ago. And recently we've been running a critical care nursing training program in one of the bigger hospitals in Lahore, Pakistan. And one thing that has uh, uh, been made obvious is that uh, the language skills of the nursing students uh, they're very bright and very motivated people and uh, they take part quite enthusiastically in the program that we are running uh, but we have to actually teach in urdu um, although we use the uh, english terminology so whereas uh, english uh, provides a huge opportunity for rapid transfer of knowledge and information uh, to developing countries. It is also a factor that holds people back. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. the intelligent people who uh, do not have access to language learning in their uh, earlier uh, education are at a disadvantage. So there can be two points of view. One is that you increase the English language teaching uh, right from the beginning so that people are quite proficient when they reach the level of post-graduation <laughs> studies, especially but also to see whether it is possible to develop resources in Urdu or other local languages. Uh, so I'm not sure which one is more feasible, uh, and from, especially if, uh, I would ask those people who are familiar with the Pakistani context and the Pakistani scene. The two options, one is to develop English, the other is to develop resources in local languages. Thank you. Um, Zohra, uh, do you want to start off and then I will chip in? Yeah, so as in being educator, uh, and uh, it's now, uh, it's 13 years of experience teaching with the nursing students uh, with a lot and lots of diversity, um, you know, within the province as well. So we do have students from, uh, as we have uh, for just for the contextual information for Janice, we have four province and the four province education system is very different. Uh, and we do have diversity of student in our program and the, the, the concern which is raised is very valid. So I, you know, it's, it's my uh, you know, experience that bridge program for those uh, students who are entering in the program is really, really important. And uh, any sort of uh, uh, bridge program, like we, we offer, the, offer them as an one year bridge program, the nurses who can able to, uh, the students can able to generate uh, their capacity in terms of language and in terms of other science subjects, because uh, of course, uh, nursing knowledge needs uh, a basic sciences knowledge, which is the requirement of the program. Uh, on the other hand, yes, the students are really bright, but our educational system, uh, it's, uh, it's lacking from uh, a lot of language barrier. But I also, uh, you know, really uh, felt during this experience that, you know, uh, we can still, uh, if the focus is on to uh, generate the science and application on the patient care and the patient safety, that uh, the language should not be barrier, you know. Our patient knows the local language. So, uh, but the science is available in English. So rather than if still our education system is not that sort of advanced where the language is an issue, uh, I have seen in Europe, every program is in French, in Turkey, it's in Turkish, uh, in, in, in other sort of countries where you need to learn the language and then, so why not in Pakistan, you know? Why we have made this limitation to the English as a language rather than to generate the knowledge in Urdu uh, like in, in I can I can share my own uh, lactation education. I'm just thinking that this lactation needs to be done by each midwife uh, who is working or uh, or uh, like lady health workers who are working at the community level. But how they will understand that science which is available in English? So it needs to be in the language where they can learn and then they can bring the change in the community practice. So I think we don't need English people to work in the community and in terms of providing the best quality care to the patient, but we need the practice and the 
advanced knowledge that could be generated into an, our own language. So that is my philosophy as in being educator. So thank you, thank you uh, and over to you. Thank you. I think I think it's also important to understand the context in which things have been happening. And I think um, uh, Dr. Athar, uh, Dr. Said has raised a very important point. And uh, but uh, so coming f somebody who has been educated from a government school from um, hum, uh, we call it Pila school, so a government school, and then completing my initial education from a place like Leari, which is kind of a very small place in Karachi city. Um, you could call it a slum, basically. Um, and then raising from there and uh, doing bachelor's and master's in AKU and afterwards. So I've had experience of both of both of all these different places. And I think the problem with nursing have been some of these have been addressed now because it used to be a diploma program where we used to get people at the point of matriculation. And Janice was asking how students are funded. So a lot of the students were coming on. So it's not only about the education, but the social gradient and who is joining those programs and what sort of education they have had, what sort of abilities they've had to talk about. Now, the issue is with medicine and some of the like um, associated health programs, we usually get people from quite affluent families uh, who have been trained in English, who have had opportunities to do it, whereas with nursing, because the element of scholarship uh, used to be involved, which has been quite limited now, meant that people were coming from families where they were not that fortunate enough. And then the teachers training and the faculty training and other sort of neglect, which has been, you know, nursing not been seen as an important profession for so for quite long time has played a, a very important role in terms of, you know, not letting people develop. More recently, what has happened that nursing is now a degree program. So we used to have a diploma program this first, which means the students were coming at the point of matriculation and then developing it through. For, um, for From last year onwards, it's a complete degree program. So we're not taking any diploma students, which then means that students are coming with intermediate science and with all those qualifications that we have for medical students. So hopefully that is going to help quite a lot in terms of uh, the, the the ability to understand English and communicate, communicate in English. The other aspect is world is moving anyway. So um, if you go back about 10, 20 years, even doctors who were trained from, um, you talk about Chandka Medical School or you talk about, you know, apart from a few affluent medical colleges, English wasn't really good. And I recently last year, went to about 10, 15, 15 universities across the country where teaching about research methods. And these were not nursing students. They, was, they were not nurses. They were sociologists. They were, um, you know, people from various different disciplines. And the, the issue of language is actually quite contentious, as you've, um, you've said, and it's quite relevant. The other aspect is because people don't read. So we don't give them the ability to read and critically think and ask questions. So all that amalgamates. But I really like your idea as to if we could use some kind of a blended approach where you teach in English, but then perhaps explain uh, explanations in Urdu. I think that makes a lot sense to people and people find it a lot easier to understand and are able to develop. And at the same time, providing information and providing uh, facilities where people could develop in English. So I think that is really an excellent uh, point. And we will be happy to support you in any of your endeavors, Dr. Said, if, if, uh, you, you know, there are quite a few of us here. So please do um, feel free to ask um, us anything. Uh, any other questions would any anyone else would like to ask? I'm just going to go through the, <clears throat> the list. Anyone else uh, who has, um, I know uh, Gulnar was on this call earlier and I think she's gone. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah, Parveen, I have one question from sure. Janice. So uh, Janice, I really like your discussion about the DNP and uh, the PhD, uh, uh, you know, uh, knowledge. And uh, definitely, you know, uh, the focus of both degrees are uh, really, uh, you know, it's a two different side of the uh, knowledge which uh, nurse scholars are generating. So uh, what do you think, which sort of blend you are talking about by having these two degrees uh, and how it will impact on uh, the patients and the community where we are working? 
Well, the vision of the, when they introduced the DMP was that, you know, a lot of times with the PhD, nurses will leave the bedside. And so when, you know, they'll go to academia, they may go to a research office within a facility, but they, they don't stay at the bedside. But the DNPs are coming from a very strong clinical base. And so it's a way to stay with the patients. And so they're, you know, what, what's really wonderful about it is that a lot of the DNPs will stay either in the, the hospital facilities or the primary care. And so they're right at the point of contact or care with the patients to see, you know, some of the issues. Why do we have patients coming back that aren't being adherent to their medication regime? Why do we have patients coming back that have this, this, and this? So they're equipped with their uh, knowledge base to go out to the literature to see if there's better ways to perhaps provide instruction, provide adherence, provide whatever, and bring that back in and test it with their patient population, look at the outcomes, see if they're getting the same, you know, did it improve? Did it improve that problem? So they're, they're very problem focused, looking to see if they can improve that patient care right at the point of contact. Whereas the PhDs, so now the DMP goes up the literature and sees, well, there's really not a, a, a research base for this. I don't see how I can improve this. So then they consult with the PhD who then they work together to create the, the research study to then generate the knowledge so that then the DMP can then take back to practice. So it's seen as a very strong collaboration with different skills. So that's the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> I, th I think it's important to distinguish the difference between these two because often people do not necessarily understand what, what, mm -hmm. what the differences are. And the PhD, as Janice earlier said, it's generation of knowledge. So these, these mm -hmm. are the people who are able to apply for funding bids, who are able right. to, um, uh, like the DNPs can also conduct research in collaboration with, with, with people who are conducting uh, um, uh, PhDs, but not necessarily apply for it. Rules differ depending on what funding agencies are generally. So yeah. you can't just use a blanket statement. But I think with DNPs, the idea usually is to be able to work in practice to mm -hmm. uh, kind of you know improve things and to ensure implementation of evidence-based practice but i think one other thing which i have found and i think we are getting better uh, more recently is that there is a lack of multidisciplinary interaction so even if, if, in the hospitals I, it's just feel, i just feel so sorry it's not only in the in pakistan or in us um, I am part of a program here in the UK, which is called Flyer. So it's kind of a quite high fire program, but even then, so there are people who are working as directors of hospitals and, you know, you know, quite big positions, um, uh, people working as clinicians. But irony is that they don't understand what nurses do. So even people who we work with, physicians, cardiologists, you know, doctors who are working with us, they don't necessarily understand what we do. So, mm -hmm. and then that all brings the debate about should nurses have a degree or should nurses don't have a degree? <coughs> what is it which nurses can do? Because it's this notion that perhaps having a smiling face, a kind nature is enough to be a nurse. Well, no, mm -hmm. it, that's not enough. And I think the more and more we are working on, I think perhaps somehow we as nurses have not been, uh, do not do much in terms of articulating as to what do we do? This is a gendered profession. So anything which we do as women in terms of caring responsibilities, in terms of, uh, you know, work we do and making sure that the nursing is bringing and coordinating and bringing everybody together into one place to be able to deliver that work nicely. So it's like kind of a homework when somebody is doing homework and the whole house is running nicely. No one thinks that that woman is necessary in the house because everything is running it. And you know, what is their work? So it's kind of a, a unaccounted labor. Similarly, as in, within hospitals, as nurses, we do quite a lot, but we do not always articulate and we are never good in articulating and which then has an impact on the image that we have, on who do we get into the profession and so on and so forth. So I think multidisciplinary education where we interact with um, Physicians with with medics, with physiotherapists, with with other parts of multidisciplinary team within the hospital and outside hospital is a way to go. And as uh, academics and people who are running the programs, designing and delivering the programs, we 
do need to take care of that, especially when it comes to master's program or postgraduate research or education related programs. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the message which I wanted to give. There's a hand up from uh, Mrs. Clara Pasha. So I would uh, uh, please join in and ask uh, a question that you may have. Thank you. Ma'am Pasha, would you like to ask your question? You're on mute. This is interesting, isn't it? On mute. <laughs> let me let me check. Hi, Janice. Hi, Parveen. Hi, everybody. Hi. All okay? Uh, thank you very much for brilliant, brilliant program. And uh, I'm happy to attend it. I just wanted to share with Janice that uh, when we talk about scholarships, I had attended one of the conferences in UK long time, I mean, US long time ago. And there were these practicing nurses, clinical nurses with their degrees. And, uh, we were appreciating that and watching everybody, how they were presenting. And thank God we in Pakistan now have those PhDs and they're doing the same work as I saw 20 years back. Uh, about the scholarships in higher education, Pakistan has been very lucky because uh, the first college of higher education was USAID in 1955. Then we had uh, Australia helping us in the family health uh, program. 22 nurses were sent for their uh, BSN. They came back to the college in Jamshoro. CEDA has been uh, part one and two with AKU and DWHP programs and so forth. And Janis, there is a, a university which is going to be built very soon with the help of Bahrain. And that is going to be a big, big achievement in the future for our nurses. And so, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I wasn't sure if there was any question there, so I would just move on. So I will ask Gulnaz Tariq to ask question. Uh, she has had a hand raised, and then Gulnar, I will come to you if that's okay. Gulnaz, you thank you. Yeah thank, yeah, you. yeah, thank you very much, uh, Parveen and uh, Janice and Miss Clara Pasha. It's very, you know, like I was listening to all of you, and I'm working in UAE. So I bring, you know, the specialty program since last 12 years from University of Toronto for nurses and doctors together sitting in one room, having the education. And that has changed the practice and concept and break the rules between nurses and doctors. So on the first day of the training, the, the, you know, the atmosphere is different because you know, I can feel that some of the doctors and then the second day it's totally changed. The, exactly. the integration into the program with the lecturers and the professor from University of Toronto really changed remarkably and that has changed the whole landscape of Middle East, I should say, because I have around 500 graduates, doctors and nurses from the same program and that has really made a massive change into, so the program is for wound care actually. So these are the people, doctors and nurses who are working across the Middle East uh, on a key positions and managing wounds of the patients when it comes to atypical wounds, diabetic foot prevention programs, diabetic foot prevention programs, pressure injury prevention, and they, they are putting their research into it. And we have a magazine, which is a journal of wound care, and then World Council of Antistomal Journal, where we publish their uh, thesis as well. So that, that program, so what I'm, I, I try to say is, the specialty program, along with this program, which you, you are discussing, I think is the is the key and then multidisciplinary approach, keeping the patient in a center, that will really make a breakthrough. I'm really very interested listening to you all. And then, you know, it's it's really very good to, to know that there are such things happening in Pakistan and we are all working together to bring the the, the nursing level up and hopefully we can all contribute to that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Gulnaz. Uh, uh, yes, we, we have been and some colleagues have been trying to do similar sort of stuff in Pakistan where uh, they are trying to establish the family medicine uh, branch, especially for, for uh, doctors that, you know, to prepare them for med, uh, something in the UK, which happens for GP surgery. So similar sort of programs, family medicine diploma and stuff, which then enables them to work in community as more prepared programs. And some of us have been trying to and working together to try and see how we can, because at the end of the day, you get 
uh, doctors with a, a, a degree in medicine. So that's a bachelor's degree. And if you get nurses with a bachelor's in nursing degree, and how can we actually make sure that the program works for both of uh, those professions so that, you know, especially in deprived areas where uh, we don't have, we have, there's quite a lot of shortage so that can really work. So there are examples in the UK, we try and kind of interact with uh, a school of medicine, try and have sessions between not only with medicine, but um, in my own school where I work, it's a health sciences school. So we work with speech and language therapists, nurses and midwives, orthopticians, and, you know, quite different fields coming together to, to, to explore various issues. So there are advantages in uh, interprofessional education and multidisciplinary education i think we just need to um, in pakistan we still haven't got the grasp of it yet i'm not sure how is it uh, in in us Janice, do you try and kind of make uh, mix people from different programs or is that or do you are there reservations well, I've, I've heard from other schools because I go out and do accreditation visits and some are really uh, making a very strong outreach to do that. And especially like in uh, simulations scenarios, they'll mix together uh, and then they'll have, um, you know, it, it's a it, kind of a range. There's some that uh, maybe there's one class they take together, others they mix and, and take classes together from the get go. So it's a it's a big, big mix right now. We're not being consistent and nor are we, um, and you yeah. know, then you have schools that don't have medical schools like ours. Uh, so it's very difficult to um, mix them together. Thank you. Uh, Gulnar, you wanted to say something? Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, I really want to appreciate and congratulate um, all of you because we all are bringing multiple perspectives from a kind of global scenario. And that is a very kind of uh, creative side of COVID, I would say itself. Um, just a couple of observations, um, like uh, Zora and uh, the other speaker was mentioning in terms of um, their own personal experiences, being a Pakistani nurse and then pursuing higher studies, whether we are migrating um, to, to other countries um, with our families or being a mature student. I think that really requires a kind of expansion in terms of our thought processes and of course the acceptability from the cultural point of view as well. So um, I, I can understand the determinants that have been identified particularly in Zora's presentation um, where she identifies financial family obligations and again language and assessment parameters. Uh, but then more towards that, I think if you are a mature learning experiential uh, kind of person who really want to pursue your professional career, in whatever um, areas, um, it, it also requires a kind of commitment in terms of um, expanding that this learning opportunity would not just only um, influence your uh, personal credibilities, uh, rather it influences much more deeper um, in your family circumstances. And when I say that, I have seen um, Pakistani graduates, those who have come particularly to the UK scenario, I would say, um, that they are on antidepressants because of the responsibilities being a mature student. They can't cope because it's not their personal journeys. They are carrying their young families. They are um, carrying maybe um, being a single parent or maybe they have become pregnant during their studies or maybe after giving birth, the entire labor experience along with the pressures of uh, PhD experience and then going to the field work. So, a rather a kind of professional journey itself, sometimes it becomes a traumatic experience altogether. And then you require a huge kind of family support, both from the cultural side, from, um, you know, academic sides, from mentor-mentee relationship, and of course, um, the flexibility around uh, the entire uh, academic discourse itself. So I just want to say that, yes, it looks fancy that we have got graduated, big names, this and that, but Nursing is all about, again, human experience. So it also uh, allow us to think more humanly for our own self-care needs and safeguarding ourselves. Um, so that is something we should be mindful of. Those who are taking a very bold step in terms of coming to a new country with their young families and then embarking on uh, their career aspiration, it sometimes requires resilience. It sometimes requires a huge kind of strong will and then a kind of determination that 
yes, I'm not going to compromise on my well-being plus well-being of my family or not compromising my own health in any regard. Thank you, Gulna. That's Thank you so much. Mm. I think that's a really important message. And I think building on to that, uh, as, as an academic and as an educator myself, and I, I think Janice would agree, um, I do need to confess a mistake which I've made as well here. Um, I think when you go to um, any place as, as a, whatever students, if you're undergraduate students, if you're postgraduate students, when you are undergraduate students, academics and everybody else are uh, do a lot of effort in terms of trying to understand your needs. They do the same thing when you're postgraduate students, but you are also seen as practitioners who are responsible for themselves and who are able to articulate their needs. With nursing especially, we, when we people come onto postgraduate programs, we see them as independent practitioners who are able to take care of themselves, who are autonomous and who have the ability to think critically and, and make their needs known and take care of others' needs. So the point is that it is really important to see what is it that you're not getting and articulating it. If there are in, in various universities, if I take example of the institutions that I've been involved as uh, somebody who is uh, working there as an external examiner to many other universities, as researchers to many other universities, there are uh, systems in place to help you with your mental health, with your language skills, with your, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, supporting you with the questions. I think, especially when we relate that to Pakistan, we don't have the, we don't always ask questions. We don't always kind of, because we are scared of disrupting the, the whole status quo and wouldn't want to do it. Just ask, if there's anything that you need to know, ask, find mentors, work with people. So I think knowing what is available around you asking for the support that you need, articulating your needs as to this is what you're finding it difficult and therefore you need help with is something which is really important. And the same is true for Pakistan. So, you know, I've studied from Al Khan University and from any other, institu other institutions where I've worked and where I've studied. If you do not ask, nobody would know what you need. And also try and develop initiatives. There are quite a lot of student-led initiatives. If nobody is doing it for you, try and see what is it that you're finding it difficult that you can generate and that you can develop for others. So I think together with all of those things, we will be able to uh, make the place better, make the world better. And this is the idea of this platform where we would like to talk about the issues and learn that we are not the only one. You are not the only one experiencing it. Every one of us experiences the same sort of issue, maybe in a different form, maybe in a different way, but perhaps the similar sort of solutions would work. It's just that we need to talk about it. So thank you ever so much, everybody. And I would just like to take final comments from all the speakers. And if anyone else have any other comment and we will close the session. So Zohra, would you like to say anything um, finally? Any final message? Yeah, so always the balance uh, education approach is important by balancing your professional and personal role is really important as in being woman. Thank you. Shahida? I think she's... Shahida, are you there? Any collaboration yes yes uh, i i i would like to say uh, collaboration implementation and uh, uh, any other linking we uh, improve the uh, with the collaboratively and implement implementation is very important Thank you, Shaida. And thank you ever so much, Shaida, for joining us. I would like to say everybody to congratulate Shaida. This is her first experience of doing a webinar. She has been really brave in taking up the challenge mm -hmm. and doing it. So thank you so much, Shaida, for that. Um, and just to confess, uh, one of our speakers, Dr. Sami Alhamadi, was, uh, 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 we were hoping that he will join us. And I made a big mess <coughs> where I thought the session was at 2 o'clock uh, uh, in Saudi time when actually it was at 1 p.m. <laughs> Saudi time. So because of my mistake, he could he could not join in. So I'm really sorry to him and really sorry to everybody else. Apologies if anyone else have 
sort of um, uh, got confused with the same message. I've also put up a link in, into the chat box. So if you would, you know, quite a lot of you would like to have certificates and then it's difficult for me following the webinar to understand who joined and who haven't. So if any one of you would like to have a certificate, please use this link and fill up the details and I should be able to sort that out for you in the next few, day, few, uh, few days or so. Um, uh, so thank you so much for joining. Janice, any final messages that you may have? I was just gonna comment that it's been very, very interesting to hear how common our issues are across the world. And it's been really very, very interesting to me. So it's been a, a great cultural exchange on, and, and it's also a great connection with other nurses. So I appreciate being here, thank you. Thank you so much, Janice. I know I have woken you up quite early on a Saturday. My apologies and thank you ever so much for generous enough for joining us. Thank you ever so much for everybody else. Uh, Dr. Athar, Gulnar, Shahida, Shaheen, everybody who is in this call, all of you are, your contribution has been really important. Uh, thank you ever so much for joining us and um, have a good day. If you all are okay, would you be happy to put your cameras on and I can take a photograph if that's okay? And uh, then thank you ever so much. So I'm just going to put this on a gallery view. So we have got... So I'm just giving a couple of minutes for others to be able to join. Okay, uh, ma'am, Clara Pasha, are you going to open up your camera? I'm just going to take the photo now. The problem is I, every week I forget how to take it, the screenshot. Okay, I've managed. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks a lot for being with us. I love it. Dr. Athar, if you're on the call, it would be good to talk to you later on. So I'll probably give you a call if I've got your number.